Butterflies definitely make the world more colorful, but beyond aesthetics, they have a lot more to contribute. They help pollinate and are an important part of the food chain. And butterflies are getting more scarce because they have fewer places to thrive. Studies show the population of monarch butterflies has gone down 90%. Can you believe that? It's terrible. Over the past 20 years. But you can help in your own backyard. They're so spectacular, people love to pose in front of butterfly wings all around the world. Our own Paula Tutman is a super fan, fascinated by butterflies and other pollinators. Oh my gosh, that's the egg? That's the egg. Now a growing number of people like Paula are helping to provide the habitats butterflies need. Suburban sprawl and landscaped lawns mean there just aren't enough plants that wildlife like butterflies can use anymore because much of what's commonly found in nurseries doesn't support it. It's just mama, you want some food? But Brenda Dizik's garden is a paradise for butterflies who need a combination of both host plants to lay eggs on and nectar plants to feed from. Different butterfly species prefer different plants, and that's often what's called native plants, meaning plants that grow naturally in a particular region. If you want monarchs, you want to plant swamp milkweed. Whoops, hi there, bumblebee. <laughs> but you want to plant swamp milkweed. Uh, they lay their eggs on any of the milkweed family, and the caterpillars feed on that. If you plant cherry trees, I have wild black cherry and choke cherry, and they're native species here, so you don't have to do anything with them. And red spotted purples will lay their eggs on them, and eastern tiger swallowtails will. Brenda even leaves out old bananas and other fruit for the butterflies to use to nectar. She co-founded the Southeast Michigan Butterfly Association, a group that meets once a month, where else but in Garden City. Has anybody seen Flight of the Butterflies movie? Terrific. Members share tips and tricks, and sometimes eggs or chrysalides. That's the correct name for butterfly cocoons. You feel good that you're providing for them. <laughs> like all your little babies, you're providing for them. So every time you're adding some new habitat in a part of the yard, then you just feel like you're putting in some type of legacy. It's always kind of a competition to see how many you can get to your yard and to try to like, okay, well, I haven't seen this one and I want to see this one, so let me try to plant for that. We used to have zebra swallowtails in this area a long time ago and people started wiping out their trees. So there's very few of the zebra swallowtails. There's some in Ann Arbor and Milan and people have occasionally seen them here. And so that's my hope that more and more people were getting to plant the pawpaw trees, and that would be excellent if we had the zebra swallowtails here. There are about 30 different species you can reasonably expect to see around here, and Brenda wrote the book on how to attract them. Raising butterflies in the garden is a complete guide to everything you need to know, like only one to 2% of all eggs laid will become butterflies. Monarchs average around 500 eggs. So if it laid 500 eggs, you might get like five butterflies out of there because there's so many parasites, predators. So more and more people, including Paula Tubman and of course Brenda, are helping increase those odds by raising butterflies inside through their metamorphosis from egg to very hungry caterpillar. I know you want to eat. To cool looking chrysalis and finally a beautiful butterfly or majestic moth when they're ready for release into the garden. This is a Luna. This is one of our silk moths that we have. Brenda speaks across the country about preserving the butterfly populations, like eliminating pesticide use and concentrating on native plants. Her main message is every little bit helps. When you talk to people and explain this, then people are planting the native plants. They're never gonna make up for all the loss of habitat, but even little islands that we can create, the butterfly can fly from one little island to the next to keep the species going. If you're inspired like us, we invite you to join the Friends of Birds, Bees and Butterflies Facebook group with Paula Tutman and her friends and watch for her continuing pollinator reports right here on Local 4. And remember, Brenda's latest book is available very soon. So lots of people have taken a DNA test to trace their ancestry back through the generations, and now pets are getting in on the action, even if they don't realize it. <laughs> Most family dogs are mixed breed, making owners even more curious about their doggies' DNA. This is Rally. She's a one-year-old rescue dog. She chose me. She went right up to me when we went to the shelter. Every time I walked by her cage, she was jumping and barking, and she like wanted to get out to be with us, and she wasn't doing that to anyone else. 
Amy and Doug adopted her and love her unconditionally. How could anyone resist this face? Like most rescue dogs, Rally is a mix, but of what? The shelter had a guess? They um, told us they can't be sure, um, but they thought she had some Doberman and a little bit of Labrador mixed with her. Amy and Doug thought the shelter's guess sounded about right. A little bit of Labrador, some kind of Labrador. Um, definitely a mutt, but it's probably my guess. I definitely think Lab, for sure. I have no idea what she's mixed with, though. We showed Rally's photo to Michigan Humane Society veterinarian Lara Silveri so she could play too. It's hard to say she's definitely mixed with a couple of things, but I would definitely say maybe like a hound, coon hound, something like that, maybe a lab. So Amy and Doug swabbed Rally's cheek. There we go. Good girl, Rally. Good job. And sent it off to one of the many dog DNA testing companies. Weeks later, the results came back. So what do you think? Labrador, Doberman, Terrier, drum roll please. Rally is a Basset Hound mixed with a Scottish Terrier and an Italian Greyhound. Did you hear that? <laughs> got a lot going on. <laughs> Missing from the results was everyone's guess, Labrador. You definitely see the Terrier. Um, I, I could buy the Greyhound, but I don't see the Basset Hound. Looking at that dog, I wouldn't say any of those probably. None of that makes sense. So if it really doesn't make sense, I would probably try a different company. And you can get different answers from different places. So there are some companies that are better than others that have been doing it longer. They have a bigger database. They test for more markers on the genes and things like that. So you know, their results might be a little bit better. Dog DNA testing is still fairly new and there are so many dog breeds and many dogs are so mixed over the generations, it's difficult to pinpoint a dominant breed. So if you have a lovable mutt, take the breed results with a grain of salt when you share them with your dog. That's you, Basset Hound and Scottish Terrier and Greyhound. How do you feel about that? <laughs> Did you know the whole time? What? I know, I, I think Rally is skeptical too. Yeah. Well, DNA testing can be very helpful finding whether your dog is a carrier or predisposed to certain diseases, which is good information for breeders and your veterinarian to have. I think I might have to do that for Zen. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dr. Silveri says DNA testing is even more convoluted with cats because unless you get a purebred from a breeder, most adopted cats are domestic short hair or domestic long hair, not a specific breed. Huh, who knew? I just learned something. Something. We'll be right back. Can your pet pose, strut, work the catwalk? Enter your super Meowdle to be our next spokes pet next.